a um, Hello, welcome to Walk in the Park. My name is Tony Ingram, and this is um, episode 213. We're recording this on January 23rd, 2019. Uh, so this is on uh, public access channel 13 in Ithaca, New York, and also it's uh, being cablecast in on channel 2, public access in Cortland, New York. And uh, if you want to see all of my shows... You can go to my website at walkinthepark.tv, walkinthepark.tv. That's a website, .tv. And, um, okay, so last week we, um, well, actually last episode, not last week, but last episode, 212, talked mostly about the, a proposal in front of the Tompkins County Legislature to manage some forest lands, some 572 acres of forest lands in the towns of Newfield, where 472 acres are, and 100 acres in the town of Caroline, that the county's owned for a long time, I since probably for the last 80 years or so, since the Great Depression. Former farmland that has grown up into uh, young forest, pretty much even age, and some of it was even planted with, with red pine trees and, and uh, Norway spruces and so forth, much like much of the forest land, the state forest land, the thousands of acres of state forest land in the county. And uh, there was a plan done up a number of years ago to log it, to have a, a, um, a um, logging plan done up, which was a reasonable plan. But a proposal was been put forth by some of the county legislatures, slater, slators, I should say, uh, who created a website called TompkinsOldGrowth.org that uh, proposing that the lands be um, managed to allow the forest to completely recover and someday become old forest again. Uh, probably take a couple of hundred years, but there's precious little original natural forest uh, left in Tompkins County, something on the order of 60 acres. And when I show this, this picture up here is actually in uh, Smith Woods, which is in uh, Trumansburg, right, in, right next to the village of Trumansburg. Uh, almost 40 acres, I think, there. And that is largely old growth. And then there's another um, Finger Lakes Land Trust Preserve that has some old growth in it. But um, uh, the, there's, there's very little left. There's, there's some in the Adirondacks. But uh, it's, we don't even have natural forest around here to really know how a natural forest works, except for that little patch in Trumansburg and uh, you know, one or two other places. And then there are a few isolated trees that are old. But uh, so anyway, the proposal was in the face also of a, a logging plan that was uh, actually bids went out for um, a request for bids to um, log this property, at least, uh, I don't know, maybe a third of it or so, 100 and some acres. Um, and uh, so there's been a move to um, maybe not do that, ask the county legislature not to log it, but rather to allow it, be, let it be, and slowly recover to become old growth forest. So, um, that has since uh, I just found out today, actually, that 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 uh, the logging plan is on hold because I didn't get anybody to bid on it. No, no logging company bid it on the logging job that was put out. So uh, for the time being, uh, we don't know what's going to happen with that land. But the uh, the desire by some people to including a lot of people in the community to have this public land be may, um, let be and let it recover from the. Um, the trauma that's been through through um, farming and so forth. Not to say there's anything wrong with farming, but maybe we need to leave some of our forest to have natural forest to even know what it is and to maybe be the center for the regeneration of other forest. Because much of our farmland has um, returned to forest because it was marginal farmland that no longer was profitable to farm and a lot of it was bought up by the state and the federal government and uh, county government, it turns out back in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 20s even maybe, and um, was reforested some of it. And so, uh, so I'll, well, we'll get, we'll get more into that story. But I went out in the woods with another naturalist named Becca Harbor who lives in Newfield. And uh, we went and looked at some of the land that was uh, uh, slated for logging and commented on it. And this is before we knew that the, their, there were no bids put in yet, 
So I'm going to show you a short video, about seven and a half minutes, of Becca and I wandering through that forest and commenting, mostly in, mostly in one location we're going to be at. So just stand by. I'll take this picture of the, the kid in the, uh, the old growth woods in Trumansburg, and we'll bring up the, uh, the video coming right up here. Okay. In the southwest corner of Tompkins County, New York, in the township of Newfield, the county owns several hundred acres of second-growth forest land, some of which it is planning to log in 2019. It has been proposed by some legislators that the forest be left unlogged and managed to eventually become future old growth. Two local naturalists, Becca Harbor and Tony Ingram, looked at some of the land marked for logging on January 16th. All right, so I'm looking at this hillside in the county forest and there are a lot of ash trees that are marked. And it's a steep hill. It goes on for I'm not sure how long it weighs. Anyway, I've been walking, I don't know, a few hundred feet at least along the bottom of this hill. And I'm looking further and it is completely a wet area and I don't, I, I don't know if that means there's springs coming out here or... Oh, it's definitely what. a drainage here. Yeah, yeah, definitely a drainage and, and actually it goes out, um, it goes out back toward Chafee Creek Road. It's all wet and that's where the tapes, the blue tapes are that I'm guessing might be indicating where they'll put a road in. But my concern is if there is logging, to get all, there's ash scattered all through this steep hillside that are marked. And I'm guessing that to get those ash, if this hap, if this logging occurs, they're going to be going all through this natural wet area at the base of the hill. And it's going to be trashed by heavy equipment um, besides what the heavy equipment's going to do going up steep hill over and over again in many different locations. It's not like the trees are all along one corridor where you could just have one road. That's what I think. Maybe I, you know, I'm not a forester or logger, so I'm not sure what this hillside would look like after the machines are done, but I'm concerned about this wet area. It's very, very extensive for hundreds and hundreds of feet at the base of the steep hill, so. Um, oh, there's a hickory, first hickory I've noticed. Shag, shag bark. Yeah. Um, but it, it's a quite a ways to get in. We walked in from Chafee Creek Road. It's taken us quite a while to get to this hillside and in between, once we got to where there were marked trees, almost all the marked trees are hemlocks um, so we don't really understand what that's all about. And there's hardly any decent sized hardwoods through the whole area we walk through. And almost all the decent sized hardwoods are marked, but they are a tiny fraction compared to the hemlocks. So not really sure what the point is there. They're going to have to like take their equipment all over the place to get such a small number of hardwoods. I mean, a handful, relatively speaking. I don't, I'm, I'm curious about the hemlocks because that seems to be the major tree that's marked. Mm -hmm. At least in that area. Yeah, so yeah, back, it's a big hemlock area where we walk through, so. Um, anyway, let's see what, where we go from here. So the first area woods we walk through from the road, it took a while to get into where they would log. It's like, um, pretty young forest. There were almost no good sized trees in the logging where the mark, the paint marks started to be. But this area that we're in and this steep hillside where the ash are marked, I mean, and we have some really nice hemlocks here. I mean, this is actually the part of the forest that in, without being a, you know, a, a forester, just 
my take is that the very area they want to do the most logging in is actually the part that would make a beautiful old growth forest if you let, let it grow. Because you have a really nice variety of hardwoods in here. You have, you know, trees that are ready. You know, I guess they have to be at least 80 years old from what I've been told about the history of this land. You have, um, you know, various sizes, including the, the larger ones. Um, and uh, yeah, it's beautiful. And the part below us right now looks pretty nice too. Hemlocks and hardwoods, and this is younger, but that would grow up. So, I don't know, the red pine area, area we walk through just had really, really small hardwood trees, right? Yeah, they were just really spindly. And so, saplings I, you know, I don't. I don't really know what the market's like for red pines. They're not. It's real probably big just red pulp pines, wood, right? Yeah. That area. I mean, this thing could turn into an old forest. Yeah. In so much faster than. Yeah. So, those little spindly trees under the red pines would. Right. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years for them, probably. So there is a lot of uh, flowing water spots, wet spots. This is actually flowing, and it's a below freezing day. At the base of this hill, so it would be a concern about logging roads and uh, logging vehicles coming in here. There's so much wet area to get to the trees on the slope. Yeah, this would make a nice old growth forest here. Getting into plantation again. Okay. Um, one of the trees that were marked there were white ash trees, and uh, unfortunately, the there's an insect that you uh, may have heard about, probably have heard about, called the emerald ash borer, who comes from which comes from Asia, which is killing uh, virtually all ash trees in the um, in, in the northern and eastern United States, um, northeastern and so forth. And um, that's a huge disaster. So I think part of the thinking is, is that, okay, that's happening. Let's go salvage some of those ash trees. And um, salvage meaning you cut them because they're going to die anyway. But the other argument is if you leave them, they'll fall over. They will um, provide soil and uh, nursery for new trees to grow up of other species, obviously. Maybe even possibly some of the ash might have some resistance. I know that people are collecting seeds from ash trees now in a seed bank so that once the ash are gone, maybe you can repopulate with ash. Maybe there'll be some that'll be found that just happen to have some resistance or maybe there can be some breeding done that would help. But in any case, um, uh, and also with the hemlocks, uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid will uh, uh, kill most of the hemlocks around here. It is, it is starting to do that. So. Can see why that those would be trees that you would try to salvage, but the trade-off is that you can do a lot of damage to the forest floor, and the recovery of the forest will be set back quite a bit of time um, by doing that. So, especially if your goal is for the forest to recover. So, okay, but well, there are some people that um, advocate uh, much gentler approaches to logging that will be uh, more sustainable than perhaps what was planned here. I'm not sure uh, just how sustainable this would be, except for the fact that it, if it uses conventional heavy machinery. Uh, but there's a group, uh, for instance, in Virginia calling Healing Harvest Forest Foundation that I found out about in a book called, um, let's see, the, the, what is it, not the, the, the secret, 
whatever the, of trees the um okay the hidden life of trees i think it was yeah i just read that <laughs> there's another book called the secret life of trees this is the hidden life of trees very good book um anyway they are in virginia and they uh, i'm gonna read a little bit about what they do they're not against logging but they um, they say our mission is to address human needs for forest products while creating a nurturing coexistence between the forest and human community Healing Harvest Forest Foundation is a 501 501c3 organization. That's a nonprofit organization established in 1999 to develop, implement, and support community-based sustainable forestry initiatives through the widespread use of animal-powered, that is horse, mule, and oxen, extraction of logs, and, quote, worst first single tree selection of individual trees in timber harvesting. Ours is a, quote, whole forest ecosystem management approach toward the end of restorative forestry and community stability. So um, that's kind of interesting. I, I, I have a little clip uh, of uh, some of the logging done uh, by uh, folks associated with this group. Uh, it's very short, but it's kind of fun to watch. So um, here, we'll put that up. Just bring us a little clip of the, of the logger with his horses bringing the uh, trees trees down off a mountain in Virginia. Actually, New York State has been a leader in um, uh, the protection of forests that can recover and become old growth forest in its forest preserves in the Adirondack Park and Catskill Park. And there's so uh, around 3 million acres or more than 3 million acres or so, uh, the, the actually dark green area within the Adirondack Park and Catskill Park that are uh, said to be forever wild. Um, this was a... Um, Article 14 of the New York State Constitution, the, uh, let me sec check something here. Yeah, the, um, okay, this, it reads, the lands of the state now owned or hereafter acquired, constituting the forest preserve as now fixed by law, shall be forever kept as wild forest lands. They shall not be leased, sold, or exchanged, or be taken by any corporation, public or private, nor shall the timber thereon be sold, removed, or destroyed. So this is a, um, this is a, um, um, one of the one of the best examples in the world of uh, restorative forestry like that to allow land to grow back into natural forest. And also, there is a lot of uh, old growth forest. Well, most of the old growth forest that is in New York State original forest that has never been logged is in the Adirondacks, but uh, not as much as this map shows, but it's within this map. One of the uh, um, most exciting areas is um, the High Peaks Wilderness. In the wilderness, you can't have uh, motorized recreation or anything in there, just, just uh, um, hiking, cross-country skiing, things like that um, back in the mountains. So this is, this is the, um, some of the highest mountains in the state here on a little mountain called Mount Joe, looking up at uh, Mount McIntyre or Algonquin Peak is on the upper right there, Mount Colden on the left. I've, I've spent a lot of time in those mountains in years past, but it's, um, it's pretty cool. So 
So, um, so anyway, the uh, the TopkinsOldGrowth.org. You can go there and learn more about the proposal to uh, create old growth forest. And this is that web page, and you can. Uh, there's a lot of information there to check out. And there'll be more news coming out as the county figures out what it wants to do. This is, uh, uh, once again, uh, Walk in the Park. And you can see our episodes. You can go online and watch this show at walkinthepark.tv. And this is Public Access Television, Ithaca, New York, at the Pegasus Community Media Center in Ithaca. So we're going to take a couple of minutes and uh, look at uh, some pictures and some words about wildlife in the forest and tracking mammals in the Northeast. Now, I um, had a show, I think it was episode 180, a little over a year ago, where uh, Linda Spielman, who is the author of this book, came and uh, told us about her book and the joys of tracking wildlife. And so we're going to spend a little bit. She has a blog. And if you go to her website, you can get the book, but you can also go to her website. If you go to lindajspielman.com, you can sign up to receive notices of her blog entries and a lot of interesting things about wildlife. And I'll give you an example of it, talking about uh, snowshoe hares. Um, let's see. Okay, so this one, this this blog host, this blog posting is going to be about snowshoe hares. And let's get to the next screen here in a second. Okay, so. I'll, uh, I'm going to read you some of the entries in the blog about the snowshoe hair that she made in December. So, the ups and downs of the snowshoe hares. Snowshoe hares are having a banner year in early December. I spent some time in the western Adirondacks and it seemed like there were snowshoe hair trails everywhere. So, we get to the next page here. Ooh. Yes. Okay. A bounding hare, like its cousin the cottontail rabbit, there's a track there on the left, leaves sets of four prints in Y-shaped arrangements. So there you go. The two larger rear prints are usually even with each other and widely spaced, while the smaller front prints are behind the rear, staggered, or behind the rear, staggered, and placed along the center line of the trail. In the photo at the left, direction of travel from, is from the bottom to the top in this picture. The hind tracks are the larger and somewhat more somewhat triangular prints on the top side. So it actually lands with its back feet in front of its front feet in terms of the, uh, the track. Um, it apparently has its back feet land first, but that's the way it looks. Okay, the right front, the right front print is near the center of the photo and the left front print is behind it towards the bottom of the frame. So you can see that its front feet are now staggered, whereas its rear feet are next to each other. The hair that made these tracks didn't sink very far in the, into the snow, so it's easy to see all four prints. But when temperatures stay low and the snow keeps falling, there may be a foot or more of light fluffy stuff on top that doesn't offer much support. So let's go take a look at the next uh, image here. There we go. So what does she say about this? That's the way it was during my recent Adirondack visit. Even the snowshoe hares were sinking deeply at every leap, and their landing patterns didn't look the same. So those are snowshoe hare tracks in light fluffy snow. In the photo at the left, a bounding hare traveled from bottom to top, leaving a triangular hole each time it landed. After, at each landing, the front feet plunged into the snow at the narrow lower part of the triangle. I think you can see that. The more widely held hind feet each foot spread out laterally for maximum support, landed just past the front feet to form the wide upper part of the triangle. The width at the widest part of these craters can approach 12 inches. Wow, cool. Okay, so we'll go on to the, to the next here. Snowshoe hares, like cottontails, tend to use the same travel routes repeatedly. This creates trails that offer firmer footing and easier movement like the one shown at the left. I've read these that these trails help the hares escape from predators, but I'm not sure about that. Maybe the predators can move more easily as well. So, what are we talking about here? All right. Snowshoe hare populations are known to go through cycles of abundance and scarcity. 
These cycles are especially pronounced in the boreal forests of Canada, where population numbers of the Canada lynx are closely tied to the abundance of hares. The Adirondacks host a greater variety of both predators and prey, although there are no lynx. And population fluctuations don't reach the same extremes for either prey or predators. Yeah, let's see what kind of predators we're talking about here. Ooh. But when hares are more abundant than usual, they, as they seem to be in the western Adirondacks this winter, young fishers, coyotes, and what do we have next here? Oh, nice. And bobcats, the main predators of snowshoe hares, those three animals, in this region are more likely to make it through their first winter. I hope to visit the same locations over the next few months, and I'll be paying special attention to the tracks and signs of all the animals in the web of relation in the web of relationships that includes the snowshoe hare. So, so that's really cool. Um, the, um, so her book, A Field Guide to Tracking Mammals in the Northeast, you can learn a lot about um, how to read the signs of wildlife, what, what you can uh, infer from the evidence that you find along the trail in tracking and, and actually read the behavior of these animals. So, um, so I'm going to take a look at that. Uh, you can go to her website and find out more about it. You can order it through her website. I think you can probably buy it. She might have a list of where you can buy it. You can buy it here in Ithaca or somewhere. You know, you can certainly order it online. So um, check it out. LindaJSpielman.com. Okay. So, all right. Well, we're kind of, we're kind of running out of time down here. We're almost done. So. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple of images uh, before that. We had all this heavy snow this week, and I'm going to show you a couple of images before the snow fell. This is at the Ithaca Farmer's Market. This is the early part of the month, and that was uh, at sunset, and then here the Farmer's Market is deserted. This is probably what it looks like now. This is a number of years ago in January, and this is what the dock will look like in the uh, summertime when you can take the tour boat out on the lake, the MV Handle. So, so I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, on uh, coming, what I'm saying. Thank you all for joining me here, and I encourage you to. Uh, I, I was I was I used to work on that boat, so I'd say thank you all for coming. But uh, thanks for joining me in this show, and I encourage you to turn off this screen, whatever you're looking at, and as soon as you can, get out and go for a walk in the park. So uh, let's uh, have a little final image here of a bobcat while I bring up the. Uh, the uh, final credits here of the show. Um...